What's up everybody, Thralls Metal here once again. I'm the Croc Nick and I am back with some more States of Metal. And this time we're going out west and we are checking out Colorado's awesome death metal scene. This is one I've been wanting to do for a while, namely because this is kind of a younger scene in terms of the death metal scene out there. There are definitely some older bands that, you know, popped up along the way, but here lately it really seems to have like blossomed into a full on big scene again. And full disclosure, a lot of this stuff is gonna be located around Denver because that is kind of the hub and because that is the hub. A lot of these bands kind of incestuous in terms of the band members because we're going to get a lot of repeated bands in most of these bands that get brought up. But first, what do I know about Colorado? Well, it's a big rectangle. It is located right over my uh, right hand shoulder. That could just be a rectangle. That might not even be the state at all. That could be a Wyoming. Not sure anyone would notice. Not sure it would really matter. Anyway, this is known as the Centennial State because it was formed in 1876, 100 years into our country's lush, wonderful, admittedly really dark history. It was probably named that because the Mountain State was already taken by West Virginia, but uh, I've actually been to Colorado a couple of times and we recently went out there for the Denver Death Pest and got to check out the Denver Airport, which is very strange. I know all the murals were covered up, but I looked at them and I was like, man, that is some really wild artwork to have in an airport. And before I got out there, I actually talked to someone about the strange conspiracy theories around the Denver airport itself, the uh, artwork, people saying that there are tunnels underneath it where like the reptilian hatchlings are housed or whatever. Conspiracy theories are weird. I do know that uh, their mascot at the airport, Blucifer, is quite a piece of work. Apparently he killed the uh, person that designed him, it, like fell over on him or something like that. Um, it's very veiny and very evil looking. Either way, it's a weird mascot and man, it looks like evil as hell at night because they light it up and I think the eyes light up on it for whatever reason. I just wanted to make it look like Satan's steed or something like that. It's also entirely too detailed in certain spots. like. Namely, it's butthole. They put way too much detail when it came down to that part. Colorado is also among the first two states to go wreck with marijuana. This is also the state that invented the tire boot and technically the cheeseburger, at least the trademark. One third of Colorado is federal land, which is really interesting. It belongs to like national parks, reservations. So I, I think that's just kind of an interesting stat. It's also the home of the world's largest natural spring. If you would like to experience being boiled by the earth, you can go there. And much like Georgia, there's an interesting stat about governors for some odd reason. Uh, Colorado had three governors in one day. In 1905, Governor Alva Adams was forced to resign due to election fraud. Now the gentleman that he ran against, James H. P. Buddy, ended up replacing him on the condition that he resigned immediately, which I don't know what the details there in terms of why he had to resign, but that was a condition on him just being governor for a day, or rather like part of a day, I guess, because he had to yield to Lieutenant Governor Jesse F. McDonald. But honestly, I don't think anyone knew the difference because if you're looking at these gentlemen, they all look the same. Like they all got the womb room. Outside of maybe one having glasses, they all kind of look the same, dress the same. It probably didn't matter. Like people just, you know, looked at him and was like, yeah, that looks like the guy I voted for, whatever. And the other interesting tidbit I found, I just thought it was kind of, uh, I don't know, just weird. Uh, Rocky Ford is the melon capital of the world. Uh, they produce more melons than everyone else, I guess. And they absolutely love that. They embrace that to the point where even like their high school mascot in the town is the Meloner, which I didn't look up what the high school mascot's costume looked like. It's probably just what I'm thinking or probably more tame than what I'm thinking. I don't know what I'm thinking, honestly. It's just a weird fact. But again, Colorado's home to some really cool death metal and again, a very young and incestuous scene and we're going to get into a lot of this. A lot of familiar names in here. I also have some more underground ones and I kind of varied up in terms of like styles of death metal in here. So we get a little bit of black and death metal. There's more death doom, tech death, progressive death metal, a little bit of death crown. We kind of mix the pot a little bit and uh, yeah, we're just gonna get right into this. Cephalic Carnage, Anomalies. This is the fourth album from this Edgewater, technical death grind, legendary underground band. I became a fan of this band with this album. I heard their single Dying Will Be The Death Of Me on a relapse comp and while I was completely blown away by the just awesome technical riffing, wild bass play and drums, the chorus that just pops up on there, 
is absolutely amazing and so delightfully out of place. And uh, it became the thing that kind of lured me into this album. And then I jammed it and it was absolutely brilliant. This one could be my favorite Cephalic Carnage album. I don't know, Xena Sapien's kind of up there too, but I flat out love this band. I love pretty much their entire discography in terms of just kind of twisting death grind a little bit. Like it definitely has elements of tech death, but it's a little bit more along the lines of like bands like Atheist in terms of like the weird riff patterns. But again, there's that squawky weirdness to it. And this band is just insanely creative, not only with their music, but their lyrical themes. There's a lot of just strange subject matter. And this band flat out loves weed. In fact, they would kill for it, uh, track 10. But the sound of this band, I just think is absolutely incredible in terms of like their wild songwriting. Kind of similar to Cattle Decapitation, but in terms of their songwriting, it's way more like loose and chaotic. It's kind of like Cattle Decap on bath salts, or I mean, in their case, at least enough weed to put a horse in a coma. But despite how technical this is, it's very catchy in its sort of like weird bonkers way, like create a lot of cool harmonies and melodies, all while being just kind of controlled chaos. Like so much of this album feels like it's on the brink of absolutely losing its shit, but it kind of reels it back in with like a good hook or a solid riff or a melody. And then you have Lens just absolutely nuts vocal performance on here where he's just ranting and raving. A lot of his vocals don't necessarily follow the meter too. Like they kind of have their own meter, much like someone ranting and raving. And I think that adds a lot to the music itself. But this band's always good about giving you a solid riff to latch onto too. Like in between the grindy chaos, there's just great riffs and great breakdowns on here. Counting the Days, Anivore, Dying Will Be the Death of Me, these all have like really good breakdowns just kind of get the pit churning. And then they kind of go back to the weird jazzy chaos. Us. And again, the twists that they throw in there, like the stuff you don't expect. Again, that chorus on Dying Will Be the Death of Me. That chorus hook is awesome. It also sounds like it could have been like just plucked out of a radio rock band's catalog and spliced right in there, but they absolutely nail it just in terms of like adding this weird hook you didn't expect. There's also the really cool stoner doom sort of shift on Peacemaker. It's definitely more like atmospheric in the sense of like sleep and like the sword and stuff like that. Even the guitars have like a slightly fuzzier vibe. The bass gets a little bit more warm on there. The variety across the board in this album is definitely something that keeps me coming back to it. Ontology of Behavior, the last track, is a very jazzy sort of spacey jam. A lot more atmosphere to that song in general. And they have some absolutely killer guest stars on here. John Gallagher, Barney Greenway, Corporate Death from Macabre is on here, and uh, Dave Otero, who actually did the production on here. This album is absolutely fantastic, and I'll just say this band is absolutely fantastic and long overdue for a new album. I've been waiting very patiently for a follow-up to their last one, and who knows, it might happen. They are still an active band. We saw them live at uh, Maryland Death Fest in 2022. They actually closed the show, and it was unreal. They did a really cool, like, Southern Rock Sludge Jam with X Hoarder, and it was just absolutely the right way to close down the festival. It was just a big party. So the fact that they're still around, still playing killer live shows, gives me a lot of hope that there'll be another Cephalic Carnage album in the future, but for now, I'll take what I can get in terms of their back catalog because it's all amazing. But if you have never checked out this band, I think this is probably the best starting point. Like the earlier stuff is definitely a little bit more straightforward death grind. This and like Lucid Interval is kind of where they start to get a little bit strange and experimental. And honestly, I think they kind of really just opened up their sound and got better. But the important part is just check out Spell Carnage because they're absolutely awesome. So yeah, check this one out and just check out their entire discography. You're going to have a lot of fun. Trust me. Blood Incantation, Star Spawn. This is the first full length from this Denver-based death metal act. Very hyped up band, though I think very justly. This was my first exposure to the band. I heard everyone talking about it and I jammed it for myself and I was like, holy shit, this is really good. Right away with the opening track, Vitrification of Blood, part one. Giant 13 minute monster of a track loaded with twisted, churning riffs. It's very technical, but it's also very atmospheric. And it most definitely worships at the altar of Morbid Angel across the board. That and of course, Time Goal. This band's comparisons to Time Goal are <laughs> still really accurate. While this is very technical and the songwriting is very wild in here, the overall sound of it is very much like 90s death metal. Lots of, you know, just cavernous howls and just kind of 
muddy but like good production like there's discernible grit on the guitars the drums everything it just sounds huge and disgusting and kind of disorienting in a way in terms of their like wild transitions but it's like disorienting in a good way and honestly just the overall sound of this album and i'd say like pretty much all their albums really captures their live vibe i'd say this band's sound is kind of like nebulous in a way like it's frequently shifting there's lots of tempo changes wild transitions, lots of spots of just atmosphere. The dynamics on here are just absolutely insane. It can shift from blast beats and tremolos to slow lurching death doom breakdowns. It's a very intense and brutal album, but it's also very engaging in terms of like the song structure and surprisingly the just awesome melodies that show up like Hidden Species, Vitrification of Blood Part 2, which I think is maybe a little bit better than the opening, despite how grand and epic it is. There are some amazing, like, intricate melodies that pop up there that really have, like, some interesting hooks to them. The more ominous and kind of melodic atmosphere that shows up on Meticulous Soul Devourment I think is really awesome. And the title track on here definitely apes a lot of, like, later death and cynic moments in terms of, like, you know, the riff work. In terms of its more technical side, it's more of an old-school sound, like, you know, like the more technical side of Morbid Angel, uh, later Death, uh, I would even say a band like Atheist too, to a degree. That sound still really appeals to me, that and this isn't like technical in the sense where it's just wankery, you know, every, you know, a few seconds in terms of like guitar renewals. This is about like riff construction, building like big lavish songs with like huge atmospheric sweeps and they absolutely crush it. There's still part of me that I don't know, might still like this one maybe a little bit more than Hidden History of the Human Race, but I do love that album. I don't know, I think they're both absolutely amazing. In my opinion, you can't really go wrong with Blood Incantation, and I'm even counting Time Wave Zero because I like that as the chill, atmospheric listen that it is. It's definitely not, you know, anything like this, like, at all. But as far as, like, an ambient synth album, I think they did a really good job. If you have never jammed this band for whatever reason, I know they are... Uh, kind of popular now and they've kind of hit like this interesting point of popularity where people are starting to hate them I'd still say check them out if you're a big fan of Morbid Angel, Time Ghoul, uh, Immolation, Incantation, lots of stuff like that you're definitely going to find a lot of stuff you'd like on here so check them out. Spectral Voice, Eroded Corridors of Unbeing. This is the debut full length from this Denver Death Doom act that features three members from Blood Incantation and Two members from the next band that I'm going to bring up. I told you this whole scene was pretty incestuous. Now, I might have telegraphed this one a little bit, and yeah, we just recently went over uh, their last one, Spragmos, which is fantastic. This, I don't know, man, this one might be like one of my favorite Death Doom albums in general. Like, this nails it on everything that I love about Death Doom. It is dark, heavy, oppressive. The production is just about perfect. This is pretty much disembowelment worship done to perfection. I don't think it's any secret that this band was very influenced by disembowelment. Who could blame them? Their lone full length is absolutely amazing. Either way, they absolutely crushed it. The atmosphere on this album practically swallows you whole into an abyss of nothing but misery and darkness. Every riff comes down to you like a hydraulic press slowly coming down to just like cave in your skull. While it is cavernous as hell, it doesn't solely rely on being cavernous as hell to create a lush and engaging listen. There's a lot of cool riff changes. There's lots of like clean staccato melodies on top of those big droning riffs. Frequent tempo changes. This can move absolutely at a snail's pace and just drag you through the murk and misery. And then all of a sudden out of nowhere break into some blast beats and some heavy sinister tremolos and just the pacing and the whole vibe of this album. Like it's just such an awesome listen. And the vocals on here are just haunting as hell. Like lots of long labored growls, but there's also like just haunting calls in the background. Like the vocal performance on here could squeeze the light out of the sun. It sounds so agonized and tortured. This whole album sounds like it was recorded in a legit dungeon. And the riffs are just catchy as hell on every song, but I mean, visions of psychic dismemberment and disillusion are probably two of my big standouts on here. Lurking Gloom is a fantastic instrumental, and I love the you know, just creepy kind of dungeon synths in the background. Yet another layer of just filth and evil and 
darkness just kind of added on to an already just evil, dark-sounding album. And the absolutely savage, slow breakdown on terminal exhalation of being is I mean, honestly probably one of the heaviest moments on this album. That is definitely saying something. I love the new one. I love Spragmos. I think it's fantastic. This album almost borders on perfection. I actually like this probably more than like any of Blood Incantation's albums, and I love those albums. This is, again, like one of my favorite Death Doom albums ever. If you're a big fan of Disembowelment, Hooded Menace, especially early Hooded Menace when they were just really slow and really murky, and even some Funeral Doom like Esoteric, check this out if you haven't. I know this is a pretty popular release amongst, you know, death metal heads and anyone that's into Death Doom, but if you are a giant Death Doom fan and haven't listened to this, I strongly recommend it. It might become one of your favorites too, so check it out. Black Curse, Endless Wound. This is the debut album from this Denver Blackened Death Metal Act. Features members from Blood Incantation, Spectral Voice, but also members of Primitive Man and Chemist as well. Actually because I saw that they shared members of those bands, and you know, not only I've been getting into uh, Primitive Man, but by extension Vermin Womb, I really wanted to check this one out, and oh my god, this album is just dissonant and evil and just absolutely one of the heaviest releases I think I have on this entire list and I've already gone through some really heavy stuff. The guitars on this album alone, they sound so harsh and just caustic. They sound like they're being played with belt sanders rather than like guitar picks. It creates this giant wall of just dissonant, ugly atmosphere. The vocals on here are so anguished and tortured. They sound like they were recorded by the gentleman on this cover, which I'm not sure if he's like, you know, backing up ass first into the gates of hell or trying to escape. I don't know his story, but it looks painful. And to an extent, I think that sort of pain and anguish is definitely exemplified on this list. And the drum work in here is just absolutely insane. Lots of blast beats. It just sounds like the drummer is violating the drum kit. Like it's just a very violent performance. The bass on here absolutely snarls and just the whole feeling of this is just so damn dark. But it's a different kind of darkness than Spectral Voice or Blood Incantation. It's far more primal. It feels like there's like slight touches of grindcore and power violence in songs like Crowned and Floral Vice. And Raptured by Decay opens up with like a wall of like static tremolos. Like it sounds like harsh TV static being played at full volume. But at the same time, there's a cool melody to it. There's a nice groove that kind of sets it up because this album doesn't like to slow down very often. But when it does, it just kind of gives the whole <laughs> like tortured vibe of this album time to expand and surround you. Most of this album I would describe as like just violent and explosive in terms of like the delivery, how the songs open up, like Seared Eyes and the title track, just go right for the throat. But there are some songs that do take their time to build and kind of set the atmosphere a little bit. Uh, Lifeless Sanctum has a cool tribal buildup and the atmosphere around it is just haunting as hell. It sounds like they're legit summoning something, but like the big tracks at the end, the title track and Finality I Behold, those are just monsters. The whispered vocals that show up on the title track and they do show up on Seared Eyes just adds a whole other level of creepy because most of the time it is just this layered, dense howl and again, tortured screams. You get some squeals every now and then, but there's something about whispers when there's like a more haunting section around. It just sounds like well, it sounds like your house is haunted. But the last two, I feel like the dynamics are a little bit more intricate and you can actually hear a little bit more like uh, character in the riffs because a lot of this, again, it's mostly about like the sonic torment behind it. But again, you can pick up some more intricacies in terms of like just some cool chord progressions and just interesting melodies in those last two tracks, especially. I love this album. This is absolutely dark and haunting. It's uncompromising and just vicious as hell. And the moments it does let off the gas, it's only letting off the gas to summon some ancient creature to devour your soul. So if any of that sounds like fun, of course, I'll recommend checking this out. But uh, yeah, in terms of like comparisons, I feel like it's closer to Vermin Womb than it is Primitive Man, because again, this is moving super fast. Outside of that, if you're a fan of like dissonant death metal and you like that sort of like caustic atmosphere, you will get plenty of that on here. A lot of black metal elements as well, but I feel like the ferocity of this, you know, kind of screams more death metal and to a degree like grindcore and power violence kind of mixed in there too. 
either way, this is an absolutely vicious listen. And if you want to listen to like some of the heaviest stuff that has come out of Denver in the last four years, definitely check this out. Allegian, Elements of the Infinite. This is the third album from this Denver slash Fort Collins uh, technical, melodic death metal slash progressive death metal act. Full transparency, I used to call this band Allegan just because I had no idea how to pronounce their name. By the way, finally we have a band that does not share members with the last three bands I brought up. This is very much separate from, actually I would say, all the bands I've brought up so far because this is just, I don't know, like kind of flat out Jeff Loomis worship. Greg Burgess, who I believe is the lone original member in the band at this point, is a fantastic lead player and a great riff writer and if you listen to this band's style overall you're going to hear a lot of tropes of Jeff Loomis especially in his solo career. Lots of flashy tuneful leads but great melodic but heavier than hell riffs. This band is technical as hell but honestly I don't think they ever like leave that 4-4 time pocket. If they do it's very rare and honestly that's kind of refreshing considering a lot of progressive death metal and tech death like to do a lot of like polyrhythms and such and while I really dig that sometimes it's like alright I don't want to have to like kind of find the meter every time they do a transition. These guys kind of lock in on that and just kind of change around the tempo a bit. Double time grooves, big halftime breakdowns, blast beat sections, but it's all pretty much locked in so you can just headbang your ass off to it. And the music they write, I think is absolutely fantastic. They find a great balance between like brutality and melody. And when it comes down to like the lead hooks and the harmonies on here, they are absolutely glorious. Now this would be their last one with vocalist Ezra Hands, who did mostly just harsh vocals. I don't think he really did a lot of clean vocals at all. But after that, they had Riley McShane, who's a fantastic vocalist, both in clean and harsh vocals. But uh, legit, when I was doing this list, I just found out that he left last year and Ezra is back. And I figured this would be a good album to bring up because this is the one where I really became a big fan of them. I thought their second album was, you know, okay. Their first album was pretty solid too, but this is the one where it just kind of all came together. All the songs are just rich and dynamic and just fun to listen to. Dave Atera's production here is fantastic. And again, all these songs just have great melodic hooks as well as just being heavier than hell. Dyson Sphere, uh, Our Cosmic Casket is absolutely fantastic. There's a really interesting video for that one. Uh, 1.618, I don't even know what those numbers signify. Doesn't necessarily matter. It is a absolutely riffy bastard. And again, if you love lead play, it is all over here, but again, spaced out really well between just great riffy hooks. You have pockets of like big epic sci-fi sounding synths, and none of this is like so technical to the point where it'd be hard to follow. It follows a steady pace, and again, it's all about hooks and melody as much as it is about like showing you technical skill. And generally the band will choose to do that on like long instrumental passages. Like when this band hits the bridge where the leads are, they just kind of lay on the riff after riff transitions and man, they absolutely excel at it. And that is definitely exemplified in the last track, Genocide for Praise, Vowels for the Vitruvian Man. I don't even know what that means either. Like again, big sci-fi concepts, but that is a 13 minute just riffy banger. There's even some cool Spanish guitar in it. It seems like it doesn't necessarily matter what they transition to. They know how to generate a good hook with it and it doesn't come across as like just pretentious and weird for the sake of being weird or progressive for the sake of being progressive. I love this band. I think all their releases are really solid. There is a lot of turnover in the band, so you have a lot of band members that leave and come back. You get new guys come in, they leave, they occasionally come back. I mean, I just found out about another turnover in the band while doing this. But regardless of that, their albums are very consistent and just pretty much catchy across the board. They are going to be on tour with uh, Decapitated and Septic Flesh too, so I'm eager to get a chance to check them out live finally. But yeah, if you love, God, I would say like Jeff Loomis is kind of the big one, but there's still like some cool classic mellow death tropes every now and then, but a lot of this feels just fiercely modern. Maybe like a bit of soil work or scar symmetry too kind of put in there. I don't know. All I know is you should definitely check this one out. And if you dig it, check out the rest of their stuff because I think it's all good. So yeah, check them out. Veil of Panath 2. This is the second album, duh, from this uh, Denver-based technical death metal act. I got into them with their first album, which was not called One. It was called The Prodigal Empire. But I became a big fan of this band when I was really getting into tech death. 
And this band, kind of like Allegian, has a lot of lineup shifts. In fact, they only have one original member, guitarist Vance Venezuela. It seems like every album that this band has put out, there has been some sort of lineup shift. And I know that currently this band features Gabe Siever on drums and Ken Sorceron on uh, vocals and possibly some other stuff because that dude's a really awesome musician in general. But despite all the lineup shifts, I've been a big fan of this band for some time. I've always liked the fact that while they are very technical, a lot of it is very centered on melody. There are tons of neo classical passages on here, some cool gothic atmosphere with synths and keyboards. And overall, I would say it's more about the riff work than it is like the constant noodling and arpeggios and stuff like that. Like there's tons of leads on here, but it doesn't feel so busy to the point where like they're just cramming every note possible into like, you know, one measure they can. And when they do lock on like good riffs and hooks, it has a very Black Dahlia Murder-esque sort of vibe, especially on songs like A Nightmare Phantasm and Clendathu. Like Black Dahlia Murder, it's very blasty, very aggressive, but there's also a lot of like good melodic sections, even acoustic passages in songs like Blacker Than and The Horror in Clay. And because this is more riff-centric, the songs show a good balance between songwriting and technicality. Not every song in here is necessarily like an exercise in terms of like showing off how well they can play their instruments. Everything on here serves the song and the songs are really just creative and fun. Uh, like songs like The Serpent's Lair has some really good Middle Eastern flourishes on it or it could be uh, maybe Indian music too. It has an atmosphere that kind of fits the setting and more than likely the narrative of the song. And this album has some really cool guest stars as well. You have both guitarists from Gorod showing up to do solos as well as members of Ublietti and Inferi as well. And even between all of the lavish dynamics and cool songwriting tropes, there's still room for like some absolutely crushing heavy breakdowns like the song Reaver. There's a breakdown in there that is just absolutely sick as hell. I'd also say this album is really good about pacing. Nothing hangs out too long. Everything is very well organized and the pace and flow of the album I think is excellent. If you're a big fan of like The Faceless back when they were like a far more functional band, uh, definitely Black Dahlia Murder. And I would say Gora to an extent, even though they're not doing all the cool lavish like tapping harmonies and such, which that band just excels at. But overall this is just a solid offering of just good tech death that is more, you know, melody centric. I like all their other albums, but this has always been my favorite. I think their debut is really solid too. But yeah, if you're just looking for something technical, but also just catchier than hell, check this out. Necrofilth, Worm Ritual. This is the second album from this then Denver, Colorado death grind act. This one was kind of like a, an asterisk, I guess, because this band originated in Cleveland. And then they moved to Denver, which I believe they were in Denver when this one came out, so this one technically works. And now they are in Portland, Oregon. Either way, I'm counting it because I already did Ohio, and uh, when I get down to Oregon, there's a lot of death metal bands to go over in that state. Anyway, this band features ex-members of Nunslaughter and Crucified Mortals, and this is completely far removed from the last two. This is just grimy, old-school death grind with a lot of punk ferocity to it. This is a nasty mix of D-beats, squawky, snarling guitars, shrieked vocals. Everything on this album is just dimed intensity with a lot of like old school punk and hardcore piss and vinegar to it. When it's not showing up, it's more punky, vicious side on songs like Ready to Defile, Vomit Dog, They Took My Skin. That's a bummer. The rest of this I would say could be very comparable to like Repulsion, Cemetery Lust, even Necrophagia. It's just fast and loose. The production here is just grimier than hell. Honestly, this sounds more like a more like polished demo and I don't mean like super polished. Like, trust me, there's a lot of grit on here, but it's purposeful. They want this to sound gnarly. They want this to sound like a basement show at a CD club that probably still smells like every smoker that went there back in the 90s. The songs are generally very short and bombastic and honestly, the shorter they are, the more they sound like Repulsion. All the vocals are very maniacal and shrieky and I just love the sound of this album like it feels like a live show and it feels like the venue itself again is just kind of rotten and dirty and absolutely the perfect place for this and honestly that's the perfect setting for a band like this like even a promoter in the club saying like yeah I have no qualms about putting this band up like I think we're insured I'm not entirely sure but 
I mean, if it burns down, it burns down. Now this album rarely slows down, like almost every track in here is a DB driven barn burner, but when it does slow down, it kind of has a little bit of a Celtic Frost vibe, especially on uh, Night of the Leech. That sounds like a movie I would rent as a teen from like the horror rack of my local video rental store. That and the song Gutter Oil, which yeah, I love these song titles, they're pretty wretched. That sounds like what most crust punks use as like aftershave or deodorant. But that song is a little bit groovier, a little bit sleazier, and just to make sure you know a lot of their origins go pretty old school, they do an awesome cover of Poison, originally done by Venom. Not poison, thankfully. But they absolutely nailed the cover, arguably adding maybe a little bit more evil and sleaze to it. This is just a fantastic listen. Front to back, this is just pure grit and grime and filth. And I imagine if you see this band live, stench. There's probably some stench associated with this. If you're a big fan of, again, like Repulsion, Necrophagia, Cemetery Lust, but also like Venom, maybe a, like a little bit of Midnight, but decidedly faster and meaner, check this out. I still need to check out their first album. Hopefully it's as good as this one, but yeah, this is just an absolute banger. Glacial Tomb. This is the self-titled debut full length from this Denver-based sludge slash blackened death metal act. I picked this up as a blind buy, and then when I looked into it, I noticed that it had some key members in it. This features Ben Hutcherson and David Small of Chemis, and yeah, once again, we are back to the uh, incestuousness of the whole Colorado scene. But yeah, when I jammed this, I absolutely loved it. I covered it in a collection update, and then lo and behold, their drummer, Michael Salazar, commented on that video and even sent me their first demo, which was also awesome. So yeah, thank you once again, Michael, for sending me that. And yeah, this is just absolutely amazing. I mean, I think it's more death metal, but there are like good sludgy moments and there are some like black and tremolos. So it is kind of a mix, but I'd say predominantly it's death metal. For those that don't know, guitarist Ben Hutcherson supplies all the harsh vocals and chemists when they get down to those giant death doomy breakdowns, which pair off so beautifully with the clean sections. Here it is all harsh vocals. He has a great delivery, long labored screams. The production itself, I don't think is like necessarily super cavernous, but it is heavier than hell. Like these guitars have so much bite to them. But despite them all being harsh, there's a lot of great dynamics to them where they can go from like these high shrill blackened screams to low guttural roars. The lower end definitely having a lot of like incantation and immolation vibes to them. And that coupled with the just absolutely savage riffs on here just gives it a very sinister vibe, especially on tracks like uh, Breath of Pestilence. The song Witness has just a soul crushing, heavy death doom breakdown on it. It is one of the most vicious points on this album for sure. And because they blend three styles on here, there's a lot of cool like dynamics in the riff work. The song Sunless Dawn, there's a really good flip back and forth between like death metal chugs and more like icy cold black and tremolos. And when they decide to slow down and do like, you know, again, a more death doomy approach, there are echoes of like just flat out like crowbar level sludge metal, albeit with like a death metal filter over it. And that creates some like good atmospheric swells again from like doomy oppressiveness to the you know blackened coldness. The song of flesh and worship has a lot of like big distant melodies on it. It's actually very catchy, but again, like very unsettling and dark. And honestly, the last track Shackled to the Burning Earth is probably one of the most melodic cuts in there. I wouldn't say it's like mellow death catchy, but it has like a good melodic hook to it that still, you know, adds like a level of just catchiness and without kind of sacrificing any of the brutality because this album is brutal as hell, start to finish. Like legit, this is one of the albums on here where I could say like this is one of the heaviest ones on the list, but I mean, I'll be honest, like most of these are really heavy. But the big thing that I love in here is that you know, black metal evil to death metal brutal shift on so many of these songs. They do it so well. The transitions are just absolutely huge and you can just feel the weight of each moment just hit you. Now this came out in 2018, so it's been a while since this band has released something, though they did put out a new single this year. I think it was on one of the Despel Flexi discs. So that tells me they're actually working on something new, which is awesome. I'm totally down for another Glacial Tomb album, obviously. Also, I wouldn't mind another Chemist album either, but I guess we'll just see. If we get both, I'm going to be happier than hell, though. But yeah, if you've never jammed this one, I strongly recommend it. Big incantation and immolation vibes, but also just lots of doom and sludge and, again, like black metal atmosphere. This thing's just an absolute beast of a listen, and I strongly recommend it. 
Fithesis, or however the hell you say that. Embodiment of Decay. This is the first demo from this Denver-based death metal act. I got this one years ago in a distro. Honestly, I liked what they were compared to, and uh, I really enjoyed their logo because it is like made out of like bones and organs and such. And I was like, well, yeah, this is bound to be some absolutely gross death metal. And to the surprise of no one, including me, it definitely was. Now this band doesn't share like members with a lot of the bands that I've brought up, but they do share members with one band that I just wanted to say their name because it's awesome. Uh, they're called Gastric Phantasm. That's like a more embellished name for a silent but deadly fart. Or maybe it's that brief pause in between a Taco Bell dump where you're actively not shitting at the moment and just sitting there sweating going, I'm not doing this again. I swear to God, I'm not doing this again. You'll do it again. Anyway, back to this band. This is some dense, sludgy, old school, just grimy, filthy death metal. Very much uh, along the same lines as like early tomb mold, frenolith. Uh, I'd even say like Cerebral Rod. The guitars are muddy and murky and filthy. It does take a little while to get to them because the opening track, Detestable Putrescence. A uh, bit of a long intro there of just like noise and TV static and background growls, but once you get down to it, this is just absolutely filthy sounding. But honestly, I kind of like the mix of it. Like it doesn't sound muddy to the point where you can't hear instruments. You can hear them all because they're all really loud. But it has like a fun layer of mud on it that you would expect from a demo. The vocals are just giant cavernous ogre belches and I absolutely love them. Definitely more groove laden. Like you do have pockets of blasts and such and D beats, but man, this band likes to lay on the groove and the breakdowns on here are just absolutely sick. Detestable putrescence and rotting verming flesh are absolutely filthy and the breakdowns on there are just fantastic. But man, when this band decides to slow down and just get more on the death doom side, it is pure filth, like old school autopsy death doom breakdown filth. The title track on here slows down to a absolutely miserable crawl. The tremolo harmonies on that song are just absolutely filthy and miserable. A lot of this kind of goes for that kind of gross, disgusting, old school death metal sound, but this one just goes for the doom and bleakness and it absolutely captures it. Now I will say, despite me liking the production for the most part, my one complaint would be during the blast beats, some of the snare kind of gets lost in there and you can kind of lose the rhythm. But for me, honestly, it's the fact that this is just riffs for days. That's enough for me. I mean, not really days, like, you know, 23 minutes, which is pretty good for a four track demo. But I really dig this. If you're a big fan of just old school death metal and you just like it on the grimier and filthier side, like Cerebral Rod especially, definitely check this out. Absolutely awesome album. Cyclonus Filth, Wake, Slave, Grave, Decay. This is the debut album from this Denver death metal slash, I mean, I would almost call it like crust punk act. Now, while it is listed as Cyclonus here, they changed their name to Cyclonus Filth not too long after this was released, which this came out in 2017. I think, at least according to the archives, they were Cyclonus Filth by 2018. Now, this is one I got in Denver while we were there for the Denver Death Fest. It was a blind buy. I forget the name of the record shop, but it's the one that's right next to the Brutal Poodle, which is an amazing place to eat, especially if you're a metalhead. I saw this in their local section, and I was like, yeah, well, you know, why not? Let's check out some of the local stuff that's, you know, more independent. And I really ended up enjoying this one. This is still very much death metal, but there's a lot of crust punk and hardcore elements to it. Like even the vocals have a more like sort of hardcore-ish delivery. They're more like bellowed roars. They don't necessarily have like a lot of like heavy gutturals, but man, this has just ferocious like HM2 style guitars. It's biting, it's vicious as hell. Lots of D beats. A lot of this kind of reminded me of All Pigs Must Die, but with like way more of a death metal sort of note to them. It does have some slower sections where they actually kind of like slow down from the like punky D beat driven riffing to get a little bit like doomier, more sinister, especially on songs like Hereth. Uh, the last track, Phantom Child and Dream Eater, those songs are slow, sinister, man, they really let that tone just ring out and they just feel evil and crushing as hell. But for the most part, this is just like pit spinning, feral as hell, occasionally almost bordering on grindcore. Soul Decay in particular, I would almost even argue is a grindcore track. Like it's a little bit more blasty, it's shorter. It's just a flat out disgusting explosive song. The atmospheric touches on here, like there's some cool spoken word or at least excerpts from you know, maybe a film or a documentary. It gives it a, a little bit more of a death metal style atmosphere, but 
overall, like, it's definitely a blend of the two. Like, this has death metal brutality, but also, like, hardcore's level of, like, angsty hostility, and I absolutely love this album. The production on it is really solid. Like, this doesn't sound like, you know, a straight-up like, independent release. This sounds like this was you know, really well mixed in a nice studio. The guitars have great clarity to them. The vocals sit nice in the mix. Everything about this is really solid. As far as I know, this is their only full length. I might be wrong on that one, but believe me, I'm definitely going to be looking for more. I know this band shares at least a member with the band Noctambulus, which is a really cool black and death metal act that almost made my list here, but the list was already getting kind of long, so I'm just gonna throw in a shout out for them there too. But I definitely wanted to go over this one because this was just a cool find while I was out in Denver. If you're a big fan of, again, like kind of like HM2 death metal, like a little bit of death doom occasionally, but also like you know, vicious hardcore and metalcore that kind of, you know, latches on to that sound in particular, like Trap Them, Converge, Again, uh, All Pigs Must Die. There's a lot of that woven in there too, and all of it is just brimming with hostility and riffs. If any of that sounds good to you, definitely check this one out. And finally, we have A Feather and Bone, Bestial Hymns of Perversion. This is the second album by this Denver-based death metal act. They originally started off as more of a punk and hardcore act, though I have not heard anything before this album. I got this when I heard a couple of tracks off of Profound Lore's YouTube years ago, and I absolutely loved it, mainly because this band sounds so much like early incantation. And I would say specifically like Mortal Throne of Nazarene era incantation. It's dissonant, caustic. The guitars just hit you like a wall of dissonance and just heaviness and it almost hurts. We actually covered their last album, Sulfuric Disintegration, when it came out in 2020, and that one might be even heavier than this one, but this is the one that I initially got into them with, and I like the fact that this one might be a little bit more groove-laden. Sulfuric definitely had like a more Ascended Dead sort of vibe to it, like just chaotic, faster than hell, even more dissonant than this one. This one still kind of labors on groove, there's still like some death doom moments on it. It has more of a old school cavernous death metal sound overall. And if I were to compare it to like other bands outside of, you know, Ascended Dead and Incantation, I would say like Outer Heaven is kind of similar in a way, especially in terms of the vocals and in terms of like the atmosphere in this one, kind of similar to Triumph or Foul. The production here is very raw, gross, it's thicker than hell, and it's done by Dan Lowndes of Cruciamentum. So naturally, despite all of the gross, disgusting comparisons I can make to the production, it sounds really well mixed. And there's a lot of cool elements that come into play in here, like you get like kind of grindy two steps on resounding from the depths, and then more filthy, grindy sound shows on the title track as well, but there are just some absolutely disgusting, heavy, and evil sounding death doom breaks on here. Mockery of Ascension, Hymn of Perversion, and uh, the last track, Throne of the Serpent, all have these just absolutely disgusting death doom breaks that are just cavernous as hell. The vocals in here are just like echoed grunts and screams and this album is definitely all about the atmosphere and making it sound more, I would say, evil than just like flat out oppressive. Like there's a decidedly more like blasphemous sort of sinister vibe to this than I would say most of the stuff on here and man the guitar tone in here is just disgusting. The opening riff on Throne of the Serpent sounds like Dismember covering Morbid Angel, so you get those creepy sinister tremolos but played with like kind of a fierce HM2 buzzsaw sound. That's music to my ears and you know fans of that stuff. To anyone else that would sound like the gates of hell being pried open. Pretty much everything about this album is just primal, savage, blasphemous, and I mean, if you like just like 90s death metal and specifically like more cavernous death metal in general, you are probably going to dig the hell out of this. If you already like Incantation, especially early Incantation, you already got your foot in the door, but I would also say Ascended Dead. Definitely some Morbid Angel in there too. Just all the dark, heavy stuff in the world, it's definitely this. I recommend this one. I like the follow-up to it, but I think I prefer this one a bit more, and admittedly I haven't heard their first album, so I don't know what that one sounds like. That could be the punk one. I don't know, but I'm eventually going to check it out. But yeah, this one, definitely check it out. And that does it for what I have for Colorado, and this was a fun one to go over just because I got to go over a lot of new bands on here, or at least like relatively new ones. As for what state I'm going over next, um, I don't know. Uh, I have a lot of different ideas in terms of uh, which ones I want to tackle next, and there's some states out there that literally have so many bands that I might go over them multiple times because they have tons of bands from different genres that I could go over. 
and honestly, there are some states out there that just don't have very much at all that I might just kind of compile into one, like these are the ones that are left. So yeah, there's a lot of possibilities with this. And then eventually I wanna kinda get outside of the US borders and uh, go check out the international ones. Either way, if you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up. And if you are new to the channel, subscribe because we do stuff like this all the time. We are also on Patreon. If you'd like to help us out there, there's a link down below to thrallsmetal.com. Our Patreon link is there. It is also on our channel on the banner in the bottom right hand corner. But if you're looking for Thralls Metal stuff, you have to go to thrallsmetal.com. We have new shirts there. We have old shirts that are discounted, provided we have your size. We even have hats too. So if you're looking for any of that stuff, click the link down below. And of course, thank you guys so much for you know all the support over the years. 17,000 subscribers is quite a landmark and yeah, quite a lot more than I thought we'd ever get. And we appreciate every last one of you. And of course, we are gonna overload you with as much content as possible. So one more big thank you because you guys are absolutely awesome. So one more big thank you because you guys absolutely rule. And we will catch you later.